All right, everybody, thank you for coming today. Um, we are doing an 11 week long reading from cover to cover of every single Harry Potter book in this lounge from 12 until whenever we're done. We decided to do this book for three reasons. First, because it defined a generation as evidenced by the students here today. Uh, not only did it teach kids to read, but it brought kids back to reading. It became a badge of honor for a child to hold a giant book in its little hands and walk around and talk about it at the water cooler the next day. So we're very glad you can join us for that. We also are reading the book because it was a banned book, and it often is banned still uh, in many places, simply because it's not generally read by those who ban it. Uh, as a banned book, it, uh, it shows uh, that people don't look at the themes and look at the tropes that show up in all of these novels. Uh, the biggest tropes that show up are overcoming adversity, good versus evil, the power of friends and family to uh, go above and beyond, and uh, these are some of the values that have uh, informed the youth of your generation. And finally, we're reading it out loud because it's fun to read. Uh, my wife first heard these books uh, from my lips. I read them as a bedtime story, every single one, cover to cover. It was a terrible bedtime story, not because it was scary, but because she never wanted me to stop. So it would be one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, and I would be reading Harry Potter and asking her, are you asleep yet? And she would say, no, let's find out if they finally kiss. Let's find out if Voldemort comes back. Let's find out if Harry kills the giant basilisk. Let's find out what happens next. So let's find out what happens next by starting with book one of the Harry Potter saga, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Uh, just a side note, this is the 15th anniversary of this book, so for those of you who are young and feel old, imagine how some of us who are old feel old. Uh, let's get right down to it. Chapter 1, The Boy Who Lived. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number 4, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Grunnings, which made drills. He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large mustache. Mrs. Dursley was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences spying on the neighbors. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion, there was no finer boy anywhere. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret, and their greatest fear was that somebody would discover it. They didn't think they could bear it if anyone found out that the Potters, Mrs. Potter and Mrs. Dursley's sister, but they hadn't met, that they hadn't could bear it if anyone found out about the Potters. Sorry, but they hadn't met for several years. In fact, Mrs. Dursley pretended she didn't have a sister because her sister and her good-for-nothing husband were as un-Dursley-ish as it was possible to be. The Dursleys shuddered to think that the neighbors, what the neighbors would say if the Potters arrived in the street. The Dursleys knew that the Potters had a small son too, but they had never seen him. This boy was another good reason for keeping the Potters away. They didn't want Dudley mixing with a child like that. When Mr. and Mrs. Dursley woke up to, on the dull gray Tuesday our story starts, there was nothing about the cloudy sky outside to suggest that strange and mysterious things would soon be happening all over the country. Mr. Dursley hummed as he picked out his most boring tie for work, and Mrs. Dursley gossiped away happily as she wrestled a screaming Dudley into the high chair. None of them noticed a large, tawny owl flutter past the window. At half past eight, Mr. Dursley picked up his briefcase, pecked his Mrs. Dursley on the cheek, and tried to kiss Dudley goodbye, but missed, because Dudley was now having a tantrum and throwing his cereal at the walls. Little tyke chortled Mr. Dursley as he left the house. He got into his car and backed out of number four's drive. It was on the corner of the street that he noticed the first sign of something peculiar, a cat reading a map. For a second, Mr. Dursley didn't realize what he had seen, then he jerked his head around to look again. There was a tabby cat standing on the corner of Privet Drive, but there wasn't a map in sight. What could he have been thinking of? It must have been a trick of the light. Mr. Dursley blinked and stared at the cat. It stared back. As Mr. Dursley drove around the corner and up the road, he watched the cat in his mirror. It was now reading the sign that said Privet Drive. No looking at the sign. Cats couldn't read maps or signs. Mr. Dursley gave himself a little shake and put the cat out of his mind. As he drove towards town, he thought of nothing except a large order of drills he was hoping to get later that day. But on the edge of town, drills were driven out of his mind by something else. As he sat in the usual morning traffic jam, he couldn't help but notice there seemed to be a lot of strangely dressed people, 
people in cloaks. Mr. Dursley couldn't bear people who dressed in funny clothes. The get-ups you saw in young people, he supposed this was some stupid new fashion. He drummed his fingers on the steering wheel and his eyes fell on a huddle of these weirdos standing quite close by. They were whispering excitedly together. Mr. Dursley was enraged to see that a couple of them weren't young at all. Why, that man had to be older than he was, wearing an emerald green cloak. The nerve of him. But then it struck Mr. Dursley that this was probably some silly stunt. These people were obviously collecting for something. Yes, that would be it. The traffic moved on, and a few minutes later, Mr. Dursley arrived in the Grunnings parking lot, his mind back on drills. Mr. Dursley always sat with his back to the window in his office on the ninth floor. If he hadn't, he might have found it harder to concentrate on drills that morning. He didn't see the owls swooping past in broad daylight, though people down in the street did. They pointed and gazed open-mouthed as owl after owl after owl sped overhead. Most of them had never seen an owl, even at nighttime. Mr. Dursley, however, had a perfectly normal owl-free morning. He yelled at five different people. He made several important telephone calls and shouted a bit more. He was in very good mood until lunchtime when he thought he'd stretch his legs and walk across the road to buy himself a bun from the bakery. He'd forgotten all about the people in cloaks until he passed a group of them next to the bakers. He eyed them angrily as he passed. He didn't know why, but they made him uneasy. This bunch were whispering excitedly too, and he couldn't see a single collecting tin. He was on his way back past them, clutching a large donut in the bag that he caught a few words of what they were saying. The potters, that's right, that's what I had. Yes, that's their son, Harry. Mr. Dursley stopped dead. Fear flooded him. He looked back at the whispers as if he wanted to say something to them, but thought better of it. He dashed back across the road, hurried up to his office, snapped at his secretary not to disturb him, seized his telephone, and had almost finished dialing his home number when he changed his mind. He put the receiver back down and stroked his mustache, thinking, no, he was being stupid. Potter wasn't such an unusual name. He was sure there were lots of people called Potter who owned a son called Harry. Come to think of it, he wasn't even sure his nephew was called Harry. He'd never even seen the boy. It might have been Harvey or Harold. There was no point in worrying Mrs. Dursley. She always got so upset at any mention of her sister. He didn't blame her. If he'd had a sister like that, but all the same, the people in their cloaks. He found it a lot harder to concentrate on drills that afternoon, and when he left the building at five o'clock, he was still so worried that he walked straight into someone just outside the door. Zori, he grunted, as the tiny old man stumbled and almost fell. It was a few seconds before Mr. Dursley realized that the man was wearing a violet cloak. He didn't seem at all upset by being almost knocked to the ground. On the contrary, his face split into a wide smile, and he said in a squeaky voice that made passerby a stare, Don't be sorry, my dear sir, for nothing could upset me today. Rejoice, for you know who is gone at last. Even muggles like yourself should be celebrating this happy, happy day. And the old man hugged Mr. Dursley around the middle and walked off. Mr. Dursley stood rooted to the spot. He had been hugged by a complete stranger. He had also thought he'd been called a muggle, whatever that was. He was rattled. He hurried to his car and set off for home, hoping he was imagining things, which he had never hoped before because he didn't approve of imagination. As he pulled into the drive of number four, the first thing he saw, and it didn't improve his mood, was the tabby cat he'd spotted that morning. It was now sitting on his garden wall. He was sure it was the same one. It had the same marking around its eyes. Shoo, said Mr. D D Dursley loudly. The cat didn't move, just gave him a stern look. Was this normal cat behavior? Mr. Dursley wondered. Trying to pull himself together, he let, him, let himself into the house. He was still determined not to mention anything to his wife. Mrs. Dursley had had a nice, normal day. She told him over dinner all about Mrs. Next Door's problems with her daughter and how Dudley had learned a new word, won't. Mr. Dursley tried to act normal. When Dudley had been put to bed, he went into the living room in time to catch the last report in the evening news. And finally, bird watchers everywhere have reported that the nation's owls have been behaving very unusual today. Although owls normally hunt at night and are hardly ever seen in daylight, there have been hundreds of sightings of these birds in every direction since sunrise. Experts are unable to explain why the owls have suddenly changed their sleeping patterns. The newscaster allowed himself a grin. Most mysterious. And now over to Jim Guffin with his weather. Going to be any more showers of owls tonight, Jim? Well, Ted, said the weatherman, I don't know about that, but it's not only the owls that have been acting oddly today. Viewers as far as Kent, Yorkshire, and Dundee have been phoning in to tell me that instead of rain, I promised yesterday they've had a downpour of shooting stars. Perhaps people have been celebrating bonfire night early? It's not until next week, folks, but I can promise a wet night tonight. Mr. Dursley sat frozen in his armchair. 
shooting stars all over Britain, owls flying in daylight, mysterious people in cloaks all over the place, and a whisper, a whisper about the potters. Mrs. Dursley came into the living room, carrying two cups of tea. It was no good. He had to say something to her. He cleared his throat nervously. Uh, <coughs> uh, Petunia, dear, uh, you haven't heard from your sister lately, have you? As he expected, Mrs. Dursley looked shocked and angry. After all, they normally pretended she didn't have a sister. No, she said softly. Sharply. Why? Oh, funny stuff on the news, Mrs. Mr. Dursley mumbled. Uh, owls, uh, shooting stars, and there were a lot of funny-looking people in town today. So? She snapped. Well, I just thought maybe it, it was something to do with, uh, you know, our, her crowd. Mrs. Dursley sipped her tea through pursed lips. Mr. Dursley wondered whether he dared tell her he heard the name Potter. He decided he didn't dare. Instead, he said as casually as he could, Oh, that son, he'd be about Dudley's age now, wouldn't it? I suppose so, said Mrs. Dursley stiffly. Oh, what's his name again? Howard, isn't it? Harry. Nasty common name, if you ask me. Oh, yes, said Mr. Dursley, his heart sinking hardly. Yes, yes, I quite agree. He didn't say another word on the subject as they went upstairs to bed. While Mrs. Dursley was in the bathroom, Mr. Dursley crept to the bedroom window and peered down into the front garden. The cat was still there. It was staring down Privet Drive as though it were waiting for something. He was imagining things. Couldn't all this have anything to do with the Potters? It couldn't. If it did, if it got out that they were related to the pair of, well, he didn't think he could bear it. The Dursleys got into bed. Mrs. Dursley fell asleep quickly, but Mr. Dursley lay awake, turning it all over in his mind. His last comforting thought before he fell asleep was that even if the Potters were involved, there was no reason for them to come near him and Mrs. Dursley. The Potters knew very well that he and Petunia thought about them, what he and Petunia thought about them and their kind. He couldn't see how he and Petunia could get mixed up in anything that might be going on. He yawned and turned over. It couldn't affect them. How very wrong he was. Mr. Dursley might have been drifting into uneasy sleep, but the cat in the wall outside was showing no sign of sleepiness. It was sitting as still as a statue, its eyes fixed, unblinking on the far corner of Privet Drive. It didn't seem so much as it didn't so much as quiver when a car door slammed into the next street, nor when two owls swooped overhead. In fact, it was nearly midnight before the cat moved at all. A man appeared in the corner the cat had been watching, appeared so suddenly and silently you'd have thought he just popped out of the ground. The cat's tail twitched and his eyes narrowed. Nothing like this man had ever been seen on Privet Drive. He was tall, thin, and very old, judging by the silver of his hair and the beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. He was wearing long robes, a purple cloak that swept to the ground, and high-heeled buckled boots. His blue eyes were light, bright, and sparkling behind half-moon spectacles, and his nose was very long and crooked, as though it had been broken at least twice. This man's name was Albus Dumbledore. Am I reading too fast, or am I okay? Yeah. All right. Albus Dumbledore didn't re seem to realize that he had just arrived in a street where everything from his name to his boots was unwelcome. He was busy rummaging in his cloak, looking for something. He didn't seem to realize he was being watched, because he looked up suddenly at the cat, which was still staring at him from the other side of the street. For some reason, the sight of the cat seemed to amuse him. He chuckled and muttered, <laughs> I should have known. He found what he was looking for in his inside pocket. It seemed to be a cigarette light, a silver cigarette lighter. He flicked it open, held it into the air, and clicked it. The nearest street lamp went out with a little pop. He clicked it again, and the next flickered into darkness. Twelve times he put, clicked the put outer until the only lights left on the whole street were two tiny pinpricks in the distance, which were the eyes of the cat watching him. If anyone looked out of their windows now, even beady eyed Mrs. Dursley wouldn't have been able to see what was, there was anything happening down on the pavement. Dumbledore slipped the put outer back inside his cloak and set off down the street towards number four, where he sat down on the wall next to the cat. He didn't look at it, but after a moment he spoke to it. Fancy seeing you here, Professor McGonagall. He turned to smile at the tabby, but it had gone. Instead, he was smiling at a rather severe looking woman who was wearing square glasses exactly the shape of the markings the cat had around its eyes. She too was wearing a cloak, an emerald one. Her black hair was drawn into a tight bun. She looked distinctly ruffled. How did you know it was me? My dear professor, I've seen it, never seen a cat sit so stiffly. You'd be stiff too if you'd been sitting on a brick wall all day, said Professor McGonagall. All day? When you could have been celebrating? 
I must have passed a few dozen feasts and parties on my way here. Professor McGonagall sniffed angrily. Oh, yes, everyone's celebrating now. We're all right, she said impatiently. You'd think they'd be a bit more careful, but no. Even the muggles have noticed something going on. It's on their news. She jerked her head back to the Dursley's li dark living room window. I heard it. Flocks of owls, shooting stars. Well, they're not completely stupid. They were bound to notice something. Shooting stars down in Kent. I'll bet that was Dedalus Diggle. He never had much sense. You can't blame them, said Dumbledore gently. We've had precious little to celebrate for eleven years. I know that, said Professor McGonagall irritably. But that's no reason to lose our heads. People are being downright careless. Out on the street in broad daylight, not even dressed in muggle clothes, swapping rumors? She threw a sideways sharp glance at Dumbledore here, as though he was doing he was going to tell her something, but he didn't, so she went on. A fine thing it would be if on the very day you know who seems to have disappeared at last, the muggles found out all about us. I suppose he really has gone, Dumbledore? It certainly seems so, said Dumbledore. We have much to be thankful for. Would you care for a lemon drop? A what? A lemon drop. They're kind of a muggle suite I'm rather fond of. No, thank you, said Professor McGonagall coldly, as though she didn't think this was the moment for lemon drops. As I say, even if you know who has gone, my dear professor, surely a sensible person like yourself can call him by his name? All this you-know-who nonsense. For eleven years I've been trying to persuade people to call him by his proper name. Voldemort. Professor McGonagall flinched, but Dumbledore, who was unsticking two lemon drops, seemed not to notice. It all gets so confusing if we keep saying you-know-who. I've never seen any reason to be frightened of saying Voldemort's name. Oh, I know you haven't, said Professor McGonagall, sounding half exasperated, half admiring. But you're different. Everyone knows you're the only one you know who... Well, all right, Voldemort was frightened of. <laughs> you flatter me, said Dumbledore calmly. Voldemort had powers I will never have. Only because you're too, well, noble to use them. It's lucky it's dark. I haven't blushed so much since Madame Pomfrey told me she liked my new earmuffs. <laughs> Professor McGonagall shot a sharp look at Dumbledore and said, The owls are nothing next to the rumors that are flying around. Do you know what everyone's saying? About why he's disappeared? And what finally stopped him? It seemed that Professor McGonagall had reached the point she was most anxious to discuss. The real reason she had been waiting on a cold, hard wall all day, for neither, a cat, for neither as a cat nor a woman had she fixed Dumbledore with such a piercing stare as she did now. It was plain that whatever everyone was saying, she was not going to believe it until Dumbledore told it was true. Dumbledore, however, was choosing another lemon drop and did not answer. What they're saying, she pressed on, is that last night Voldemort turned up in Godric's Hollow. He went to find the Potters. The rumor is that Lily and James Potter are, oh, well, that they're dead. Dumbledore bowed his head. Professor McGonagall gasped. Lily and James, I can't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. Oh, Albus. Dumbledore reached out and patted her on the shoulder. I know, I know, he said heavily. Professor McGonagall's voice trembled as she went on. That's not all. They're saying he tried to kill the Potter's son, Harry, but he couldn't. He, he couldn't kill that little boy. No one knows why or how, uh, but they're saying that when he couldn't kill Harry Potter, Voldemort's power somehow broke, and that's why he's gone. Dumbledore nodded glumly. It, is, it, is it true? faltered Professor McGonagall. After all, he's done uh, all the people he's killed, he couldn't kill a little boy. It's just astounding. Of all the things to stop him. But how in the name of heaven did Harry survive? We can only guess, said Dumbledore. We may never know. Professor McGonagall pulled out a lace handkerchief and dabbed at her eyes beneath her spectacles. Dumbledore gave a great sniff as he took a gold watch from his pocket and examined it. It was a very odd watch. It had 12 hands, but no numbers. Instead, little planets were moving around the edge. It must have made sense to Dumbledore, though, because he put it back in his pocket and said, Hagrid's late. I suppose it, it was he who told you I'd be here. Yes, said Professor McGonagall, and I don't suppose you're going to tell me why you're here of all places? I've come to bring Harry to his aunt and uncle. They're the only family he has left now. You don't, you don't mean, you, you can't mean the people who live here, said, cried Professor McGonagall, jumping to her feet and pointing at number four. Dumbledore, you can't. I've been watching them all day. They couldn't find two people who were less like us, and they've got their son. Oh, I saw him kicking his mother all the way up the street, screaming for sweets. Harry Potter, come and live here? It's the best place for him, said Dumbledore firmly. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain everything to him when he's older. I've written them a letter. A letter? repeated Professor McGonagall faintly, sitting back down the wall. 
Really, Dumbledore? You think you can explain all this in a letter? These people will never understand him. They'll be famous. A legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future. There will be books written about Harry. Every child in the world will know his name. Exactly, said Dumbledore, looking very seriously over the top of his half-moon glasses. It would be enough to turn any boy's head. Famous before he can walk and talk. Famous for something he won't remember. Can you see how much better off he'll be growing up away from all that he's, he is until he's ready to take it? Professor McGonagall opened her mouth, changed her mind, swallowed, and then said, Yes, yes, you're right, of course. But how is the boy getting here, Dumbledore? She eyed his cloak suddenly as though she thought he might be hiding Harry underneath it. Hagrid's bringing him. You think it's wise to trust Hagrid with something as important as this? I would trust Hagrid with my life, said Dumbledore. I'm not saying his heart isn't in the right place, said Professor McGonagall grudgingly, but you can't pretend he's not careless. He does tend to... What was that? A low rumbling sound had broken the sounds around them. It grew steadily louder as they looked up and down the street for some signs of a headlight. It swelled to a roar as they both looked up at the sky, and a huge motorcycle fell out of the air and landed on the road in front of them. Oh. If the motorcycle was huge, it was nothing to the man sitting astride it. He was almost twice as tall as a normal man and at least five times as wide. He looked simply too big to be allowed and so wide, wild. Long tangles of bushy hair and beard hid most of his face and had hands the size of trash can lids. His feet in the leather boots were like baby dolphins. In his vast muscular arms, he was holding a bundle of blankets. Hagrid, said Dumbledore, sounding relieved. At last. And uh, did you get, where did you get that motorcycle? Bored it, Professor Dumbledore, sir, said the giant, climbing carefully off the motorcycle as he spoke. Young Sirius Black lent him to me, and I've got him, sir. No problems, were there? No, sir. House almost destroyed, but I got him and uh, got out right before the muggle started swarming about. He fell asleep as I was flying over Bristol. Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall bent forward over the bundle of blankets. Inside, just visible, was a baby boy fast asleep. Under a tuft of jet black hair over his forehead, they could see a curiously shaped cut like a bolt of lightning. Is that where... Professor McGonagall whispered. Yes, said Dumbledore. He'll have that scar forever. Couldn't you do something about it, Dumbledore? Even if I could, I wouldn't. Scars can come in handy. I have one myself above my knee. That's a perfect map of the London Underground. Well, give him here, Hagrid. We'd better get this over with. Dumbledore took Harry in his arms and turned towards the Dursley's house. Could I, uh, could I say goodbye to him, sir, said Hagrid. He bent his great shaggy head over Harry and gave him what must have been a very sketchy, whiskery kiss. Then suddenly, Hagrid let out a howl like a wounded dog. Shh, hissed Professor McGonagall. You'll wake up the muggles. Sorry, <laughs> sobbed Hagrid, taking out a large spotted handkerchief and burying his face in it. I can't stand it. Oh, Lily and James dead and poor little Harry off to live with muggles. Yes, yes, it's all very sad, but, but get a grip on yourself, Hagrid, or, or we'll be found, Professor McGonagall whispered, patting Hagrid gingerly on the arm as Dumbledore stepped over the low garden wall and walked to the front door. He laid Harry gently on the doorstep, took a letter out of his cloak, tucked it inside Harry's blanket, and then came back to the other two. For a full moment, minute, the three of them stood and looked at the little bundle. Hagrid's shoulders shook, Professor McGonagall blinked furiously, and the twi twinkling light that usually shone from Dumbledore's eyes seemed to have gone out. Well, said Dumbledore finally, that's that. We've no business staying here. We might as well go and join the celebrations. Yeah, said Hagrid in a very muffled voice. I'll be taking Sirius' his boy back. Good night, Professor McGonagall. Good night, Dumbledore, sir. Wiping his streaming eyes on his jacket sleeve, Hagrid swung himself onto the motorcycle and kicked the engine into life. With a roar, it rose into the air and off into the night. I shall see you soon, I expect, Professor McGonagall, said Dumbledore, nodding to her. Professor McGonagall blew her nose in reply. Dumbledore turned and walked back down the street. On the corner, he stopped and took out the put silver put outer. He clicked it once, and twelve balls of light sped back to their street lamp, so the privet drive glowed suddenly orange, and he could make out a tabby cat slinking around the corner at the other end of the street. He could just see the bundle of blankets on the step of number four. Good luck, Harry, he murmured. He turned on his heel, and with a swish of his cloak, he was gone. A breeze ruffled the he neat hedges of Privet Drive, which lay silent and tidy under the inky sky, the very last place you'd expect astonishing things to happen. Harry pulled Potter and rolled over inside his blankets without waking up, one small hand closed on a letter beside him, and he slept on, not knowing he was special, not knowing he was famous, 
not knowing he would be woken in a few hours' time by Mrs. Dursley's scream as she opened the front door to put out the milk bottles. Not that he would spend the next few weeks being prodded and pinched by his cousin Dudley. He couldn't know that at this very moment people meeting in secret all over the country were holding up their glasses and saying in hushed voices to Harry Potter, the boy who lived. The second chapter of Harry Potter has a couple references to Brazil, and J.K. Rowling speaks a little Portuguese, having spent time in Portugal and married a Brazilian, a Portuguese journalist. And Harry Potter has been published around the world, including in Brazil. And I have the Brazilian translation of Harry Potter, and when they talk about Brazil, I'm going to read a little bit from this. Chapter 2, The Vanishing Glass. Nearly ten years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step, but Privet Drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose in the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursleys' front door. It crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night when Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different colored bonnets. But Dudley Dursley was no longer a baby, and now the photograph showed a large blonde boy riding his first bicycle on a carousel at the fair, playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no sign at all that another boy lived in the house, too. Is this okay? This, okay. Yet Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His Aunt Petunia was awake, and it was her shrill voice that made the first noise of the day. Up! Get up! Now! Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. Up! She screeched. Harry heard her walking toward the kitchen and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the stove. He rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he had been having. It had been a good one. There had been a flying motorcycle in it. He had a funny feeling he'd had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet? She demanded. Nearly, said Harry. Well, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon. And don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect on Duddy's birthday. Harry groaned. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing, nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could he have forgotten? Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed and, after pulling a spider off one of them, put them on. Harry was used to spiders, because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them, and that was where he slept. When he was dressed, he went down the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had gotten the new computer he wanted, not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry, as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise. Unless, of course, it involved punching somebody. Dudley's favorite punching bag was Harry but he couldn't often catch him. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small and skinny for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was because all he had to wear were old clothes of Dudley's, and Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Dudley had a thin face, knobbly knees, black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with a lot of scotch tape, because of all the times Dudley had punched him on the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead that was shaped like a bolt of lightning. He had had it as long as he could remember, and the first question he could re ever remember asking his Aunt Petunia was how he had gotten it. In the car crash when your parents died, she had said, and don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. That was the first rule for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was running over the bacon, turning over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked, by way of a morning greeting. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together, but it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way, all over the place. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much neck, small watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick, fat head. Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plates of egg and bacon on the table, which was difficult as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presents. 
His face fell. 36, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you haven't counted Auntie Marge's present, see? It's here under the big one for Mommy and Daddy. All right, 37 then, said Dudley, going red in the face. Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on, began wolfing down his bacon as fast as possible in case Dudley turned the table over. Aunt Petunia obviously scented danger too, because she said quickly, and we'll buy you another two presents while we're out today. How's that, Popkin? Two more presents. Is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. It looked like hard work. Finally, he said slowly, so I'll have 30, 30, 39, sweetums, said Aunt Petunia. Oh, Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right, then. Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little Tyke wants his money's worth just like his father. boy, Dudley. He ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang, and Aunt Petunia went, Petunia went to answer it, while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, a video camera, a remote control airplane, 16 new computer games, and a VCR. He was ripping the paper off a gold wristwatch when Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone looking both angry and worried. Bad news, Vernon, she said. Mrs. Figg's broken her leg. She can't take him. She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror, but Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, hamburger restaurants, or the movies. Every year, Harry was left behind with Mrs. Fig, a mad old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled of cabbage, and Mrs. Fig made him look at photographs of all the cats she'd ever owned. Now what, said Aunt Petunia, looking furiously at Harry, though he'd planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs. Fig had broken her leg, but it wasn't easy when he reminded himself it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibbles, Snowy, Mr. Paws, and Tufty again. We could phone Marge, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly, Vernon. She hates the boy. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather, as though he was something very nasty that couldn't stand them, that couldn't understand them like a slug. Uh, what about what's her name? Your friend, Yvonne. On vacation in Mallorca, snapped Aunt Petunia. You could just leave me here, Harry put in hopefully. He'd be able to watch what he wanted on television for a change and maybe even have a go on Dudley's computer. Aunt Petunia looked as if she'd just swallowed a lemon. And come back and found the house in ruins, she snarled. I won't blow up the house, said Harry. But they weren't listening. I suppose we could take him to the zoo, said Aunt Petunia slowly, and leave him in the car. That car's new. He's not sitting in it alone. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It had been years since he'd really cried. But he knew that if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Dinky, Daddy Dumps, don't cry. Mommy won't let him spoil your special day, she cried, flinging her arms around him. I don't want him to come, Dudley yelled between huge pretend sobs. He always spoils everything. He shot Harry a nasty grin through the gap in his mother's arms. Just then, the doorbell rang. Oh, good Lord, they're here, said Aunt Petunia frantically. And a moment later, Dudley's best friend, Pier Piers Polkis, walked in with his mother. Piers was a scrawny boy with a face like a rat. He was usually the one who held people's arms behind their backs while Dudley hit them. Dudley stopped pretending to cry at once. Half an hour later, Harry, who couldn't believe his luck, was sitting in the back of the Dursley's car with Piers and Dudley on the way to the zoo for the first time in his life. His aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anything else to do with him, but before they left, Uncle Vernon had taken Harry aside. I'm warning you, he said, putting his large purple voice, face right up next to Harry's. I'm warning you now, boy. Any funny business, anything at all, and you'll be in the cupboard from now until Christmas. I'm not going to do anything, said Harry, honestly. But Uncle Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was, strange things often happened around Harry, and it was just no good telling the Dursleys he didn't make them happen. Once, Aunt Petunia, tired of Harry coming back from the barbers looking as though he hadn't been at all, had taken a pair of kitchen scissors and cut his hair so short that he was almost bald, except for his bangs, which she left to hide that horrible scar. Dudley had laughed himself silly at Harry, who had spent the sleepless night imagining school the next day, where he was already laughed at for his baggy clothes and taped glasses. Next morning, however, he'd, woken, he'd gotten up to find his hair exactly as it had been before Aunt Petunia had sheared it off. 
He had been given a week in his cupboard for this, even though he tried to explain that he couldn't explain how it had grown back so quickly. Another time, Aunt Petunia had been trying to force him into a revolting old sweater of Dudley's, brown with orange puffballs. The harder she tried to pull it over his head, the smaller it seemed to become, until finally it might have fitted a hand puppet, but certainly wouldn't fit Harry. Aunt Petunia had decided it must have shrunk in the wash, and to his great relief, Harry wasn't punished. On the other hand, he'd gotten into terrible trouble for being found on the roof of his school kitchens. Dudley's gang had been chasing him as usual when, as much to Harry's surprise as anyone else's, there he was sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys had received a very angry letter from Harry's headmistress, telling them Harry had been climbing school buildings. But all he tried to do was, as he shouted at, at Uncle Vernon through the locked door of his cupboard, was jump behind the big trash cans outside the kitchen doors. Harry supposed that the wind must have caught him in mid-jump. But today, nothing was going to go wrong. It was even worth being with Dudley and Pierce to be spending the day somewhere that wasn't school, his cupboard, or Mrs. Figg's cabbage-smelling living room. While he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt Petunia. He liked to complain about things. People at work, Harry, the council, Harry, the bank, and Harry were just a few of his favorite subjects. This morning, it was motorcycles. Roaring along like maniacs, the young hoodlums, he said, as a motorcycle overtook them. I had a dream about a motorcycle, said Harry, remembering suddenly. It was flying. Uncle Vernon nearly crashed into the car in front. He turned around, turned right around in his seat and yelled at Harry, his face like a gigantic beat with a mustache. Motorcycles don't fly, Dudley and Pierce sniggered. I know they don't, said Harry. It was only a dream. But he wished he hadn't said anything. If there was one thing that Dursleys hated even more than his asking questions, it was his talking about anything acting in a way it shouldn't. No matter if it was in a dream or even a cartoon, they seemed to think he might get dangerous ideas. It was a very sunny Saturday, and the zoo was crowded with families. The Dursleys brought Dudley and Pierce large chocolate ice creams at the entrance, and then, because the smiling lady in the van had asked Harry what he wanted before they could hurry him away, they bought him a cheap lemon ice pop. It wasn't bad either, Harry thought, licking it as they watched the gorilla scratching its head who looked remarkably like Dudley, except that it wasn't blonde. Harry had the best morning he'd had in a long time. He was careful to walk a little apart from the Dursleys so that Dudley and Pierce, who were starting to get bored with the animals by lunchtime, couldn't fall back on their favorite hobby of hitting him. They ate in the zoo restaurant, and when Dudley had a tantrum because his Knickerbocker glory didn't have enough ice cream on top, Uncle Vernon brought him another one, and Harry was allowed to finish the first. Harry felt afterwards that should have, he should have known it was all too good to last. After lunch, they went to the reptile house. It was cool and dark in there, with lit windows all along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling and slithering over bits of wood and stone. Dudley and Piers wanted to see huge poisonous cobras and thick, man-crushing pythons. Dudley quickly found the largest snake in the place. It could have wrapped its body twice around Uncle Vernon's car and crushed it into a trash can. But at the moment, it didn't look in the mood. In fact, it was fast asleep. Dudley stood with his nose pressed against the glass, glaring at the, staring at the glistening brown coils. Make it move, he whined at his father. Uncle Vernon tapped on the glass, but the snake didn't budge. Do it again, Dudley ordered. Uncle Vernon wrapped the glass smartly with his knuckles, but the snake just snoozed on. This is boring, Dudley moaned. He shuffled away. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked intently at the snake. He wouldn't have been surprised if it had died of boredom, if it, if it died of boredom itself. No company except stupid people drumming their fingers in the glass trying to disturb it all day long. It was worse than having a cupboard as a bedroom, where the only visitor was Aunt Petunia hammering on the door to wake you up. At least he got to visit the rest of the house. The snake suddenly opened its beady eyes. Slowly, very slowly, it raised its head until its eyes were on a level with Harry's. It winked. Harry stared. Then he looked quickly around to see if anybody else was watching. They weren't. He looked back at the snake and winked too. The snake jerked its head toward Uncle Vernon and Dudley, then raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look that said quite plainly, I get that all the time. I know, Harry murmured through the glass, though he wasn't sure the snake could hear him. It must be really annoying. The snake nodded vigorously. Where do you come from anyway? Harry asked. A cobra apontou com o rabo uma placa próxima ao vidro. 
Harry Espio, boa constrictor, Brazil. Era bom lá. A jiboia apontou novamente a placa com o rabo de Harry Leo. Esta espécie nasceu em cativeiro. Ah, entendo. Então você nunca esteve no Brasil? A cobra sacudiu a cabeça, mas um grito ensurdecedor, ensurdecedor atras, atrás de Harry fez os dois pularem. Tuda, senhora Dursley, venham ver essa cobra. Vocês não vão acreditar o que está fazendo. Duda veio bamboleando até onde o amigo estava mais de braço que pode. Cai fora! Falou dando um soco nas costelas de Harry. Apanhado de surpresa, Harry caiu com força no chão do concreto. O que se passou em seguida aconteceu tão depressa que ninguém viu como foi. No segundo, Pedro e Duda encostados no vidro. No segundo seguinte, estavam saltando para trás, soltou, soltando uivos de terror. Harry sentou-se e parou de respirar. O vidro da frente do tanque da jiboia tinha sumido. A grande cobra se desenrolou depressa e escorregou pelo chão. As pessoas no alojamento dos reptais gritaram e começaram a correr pelas saídas. Quando a cobra passou rápido por ele, Harry podia jurar que uma voz baixa e similante tinha dito Brasil, aqui vou eu. Obrigada, amigo. So, in English. Where do you come from anyway, Harry asked. The snake jabbed its tail at a little sign next to the glass. Harry peered at it. Boa constrictor, Brazil. Was it nice there? The boa constrictor jabbed its tail at the sign again, and Harry read on. This specimen was bred in the zoo. Oh, I see. So you've never been to Brazil? As the snake shook its head, a deafening shout behind Harry made both of them jump. Dudley, Mr. Dursley, come and look at this snake. You won't believe what it's doing. Dudley came waddling toward them as fast as he could. Out of the way, you, he said, punching Harry in the ribs. Caught by surprise, Harry fell hard on the concrete floor. What came next happened so fast, no one saw how it happened. One second, Piers and Dudley were leaning right up close to the glass. The next, they had leapt back with howls of horror. Harry sat up and gasped. The glass front of the blow constrictor's tank had vanished. The great snake was uncoiling itself rapidly, slithering out onto the floor. People throughout the reptile house screamed and started running for the exits. As the snake slid swiftly past him, Harry could have sworn a low hissing voice said, Brazil, here I come. Thanks, amigo. The keeper of the reptile house was in shock. But the glass, he kept saying, where did the glass go? The zoo director himself made Aunt Petunia a cup of strong sweet tea while he apologized over and over again. Piers and Dudley could only gibber. As far as Harry had seen, the snake hadn't done anything except snap playfully at, his heels, at their heels as it passed. But by the time they were all back in Uncle Vernon's car, Dudley was swearing that he had tried to squeeze him to death. But worst of all, for Harry at least, was Piers calming down enough to say, Harry was talking to it, weren't you, Harry? Uncle Vernon waited until Piers was safely out of the house before starting on Harry. He was so angry he could scarcely speak. He managed to say, go, cupboard, stay, no meals, before he collapsed into a chair and Aunt Petunia had to run and get him a large brandy. Harry lay in his dark cupboard much later, wishing he had a watch. He didn't know what time it was and he couldn't be sure the Dursleys were asleep yet. Until they were, he couldn't risk sneaking to the kitchen for some food. He lived with the Dursleys almost 10 years, 10 miserable years, as long as he could remember, ever since he'd been a baby and his parents had died in that car crash. He couldn't remember being in the car when his parents had died. Sometimes, when he strained his memory during long hours in his cupboard, he came up with a strange vision, a blinding flash of green light and a burning pain on his forehead. This, he supposed, was the crash, though he couldn't imagine where all the green light came from. He couldn't remember his parents at all. His aunt and uncle never spoke about them, and of course he was forbidden to ask questions. There were no photographs of them in the house. When he had been younger, Harry had dreamed and dreamed of some unknown relation coming to take him away, but it had never happened. The Dursleys were his only family. Yet sometimes he thought, or maybe hoped, that strangers in the street seemed to know him. Very strange strangers they were, too. A tiny man in a violet top hat had bound to him once while out shopping with Aunt Petunia and Dudley. After asking furiously if he knew the man, Aunt Petunia had rushed them out of the shop without buying anything. A wild-looking old woman, dressed in green, had, made, had waved merrily at him once on a bus. A bald man in a very long purple coat had actually shaken his hand in the street the other day and then walked away without a word. 
The weirdest thing about all these people was the way they seemed to vanish the second Harry had tried to get a closer look. At school, Harry had no one. Everybody knew that Dudley's gang hated that odd Harry Potter in his baggy old clothes and broken glasses, and nobody liked to disagree with Harry's gang, with Dudley's gang. Sorry. into a raffle that will be held on December 5th uh, to win a Kindle with all the Harry Potter books on it. If you show up in full costume, you get another raffle ticket. Every time you read and every time you come in costume, you get a raffle ticket. What if we perform some magic for you guys? If you can perform real magic, then I will buy you the Kindle myself. Okay. Thank you. Just read the whole chapter. Chapter 3, The Letters from No One. The escape of a Brazilian boa constrictor earned Harry his longest ever punishment. By the time he was allowed out of his cupboard again, the summer holidays had started, and Dudley had already broken his new video camera, crashed his remote control airplane, and, first time on his racing bike, knocked down old Mrs. Fig as she crossed Pivot Drive in her crutches. Harry was glad school was over, but there was no escaping Dudley's gang, who visited the house every single day. Piers, Dennis, Malcolm, and Gordon were all big and stupid. But as Dudley was the biggest and stupidest of the lot, he was the leader. The rest of them were all quite happy to join Dudley's favorite sport, Harry hunting. This was why Harry spent as much time as possible out of the house, wandering around and thinking about the end of the holidays, where he could see a tiny ray of hope. When September came, he would be going off to the secondary school, and for the first time in his life, he wouldn't be with Dudley. Dudley had already been accepted to Uncle Vernon's old private school, Smeltings. Piers Polkis was going there too. Harry, on the other hand, was going to Stonewall High, the local public school. Dudley thought this was very funny. They stuffed people's heads down the toilet the very first day at Stonewall, he told Harry. Want to come upstairs and practice? No thanks, said Harry. The poor toilet's never had anything as horrible as your head down it. It might be sick. Then he ran before Dudley could work out what he said. One day in July, Aunt Petunia took Dudley to London to buy his smelting's uniform, leaving Harry at Mrs. Fig's. Mrs. Fig wasn't as bad as usual. It turned out she'd broken her leg tripping all over one of her cats, and she didn't seem quite as fond of them as before. She let Harry watch television and gave him a bit of chocolate cake that tasted as though she had it for several years. That evening, Dudley paraded around the living room for the family in his brand new uniform. Smelting boys wore maroon tailcoats, orange knickerbockers, and flat straw hats called boaters. They also carried knobbly sticks, using for hitting each other while the teacher wasn't looking. This was supposed to be good training for later life. As he looked at Dudley in his new knickerbockers, Uncle Vernon said gruffly that, this was the, that it was the proudest moment of his life. Aunt Petunia burst into tears and said she couldn't believe it was her ickle duddykins. He looked so handsome and grown up. Harry didn't trust himself to speak. He thought two of his ribs might have already cracked from not trying to laugh. Right, I gotta get back to work. <laughs> There was a horrible smell in the kitchen the next morning when Harry went in for breakfast. It seemed to be coming from a large metal tub in the sink. He went to have a look. The tub was full of what looked like dirty rags swimming in gray water. What's this? He asked Aunt Petunia. Her lips tightened as they always did if he dared to ask a question. Your new school uniform, she said. Harry looked in the bowl again. Oh, he said, 
I didn't realize it had to be so wet. Don't be stupid, snapped Aunt Petunia. I'm dying some of Dudley's old things gray for you. It'll look just like everyone else's when I finished. Harry seriously doubted this, but thought it best not to argue. He sat down at the table and tried not to think about how he was going to look on his first day at Stonewall High. Like he was wearing bits of old elephant skin, probably. Dudley and Uncle Vernon came in, both with wrinkled noses because of the smell from Harry's new uniform. Uncle Vernon opened his newspaper as usual, and Dudley banged his smelting stick, which he carried everywhere, on the table. They heard the click of the mail slot and flop of letters on the doormat. Get the mail, Dudley, said Uncle Vernon from behind his paper. Make Harry get it. Get the mail, Harry. Make Dudley get it. Poke him with your smelting stick, Dudley. Harry dodged the smelting stick and went to get the mail. Three things lay on the doormat. A postcard from Uncle Vernon's sister, Marge, who was vacationing on the Isle of Wight, a brown envelope that looked like a bill, and a letter for Harry. Harry picked it up and stared at it, his heart twanging like a giant elastic band. No one, ever, in his whole life had written to him. Who would? He had no friends, no other relatives. He didn't belong to the library, so he'd never even gotten rude notes asking for books back. Yet here it was, a letter addressed so plainly there could be no mistake. Mr. H. Potter, the cupboard under the stairs, four privet drive, little winging, Surrey. The envelope was thick and heavy, made of yellowish parchment, and the address was written in emerald green ink. There was no stamp. Turning the envelope over, his hand trembling, Harry saw a purple wax seal bearing a coat of arms, a lion, an eagle, a badger, and a snake surrounding a large letter H. Hurry up, boy, shouted Uncle Vernon from the kitchen. What are you doing, checking for letter bombs? He chuckled at his own joke. Harry went back to the kitchen, still staring at his letter. He handed Uncle Vernon the bill on the postcard, sat down, and slowly began to open the yellow envelope. Uncle Vernon ripped open the bill, snorted in disgust, and flipped over the postcard. Marge is ill, he informed Aunt Petunia. Ate a funny whelk. <coughs> Dad, said Dudley suddenly. Dad, Harry's got something. Harry was on the point of unfolding his letter, which was written on the same heavy parchment as the envelope, when it was jerked sharply out of his hand by Uncle Vernon. That's mine, said Harry, trying to snatch it back. Who'd be writing to you, sneered Uncle Vernon, shaking the letter open with one hand and glancing at it. His face went from red to green faster than a set of traffic lights, and it didn't stop there. Within seconds, it was the grayish white of old porridge. P Petunia, he gasped. Dudley tried to grab the letter to read it, but Uncle Vernon held it high out of his reach. Aunt Petunia took it curiously and read the first line. For a moment, it looked as though she might faint. She clutched her throat and made a choking noise. Vernon! Oh my goodness, Vernon! They stared at each other, seeming to have forgotten that Harry and Dudley were still in the room. Dudley wasn't used to being ignored. He gave his father a sharp tap on the head with his smelting stick. I want to read that letter, he said loudly. I want to read it, said Harry furiously, as it's mine. Get out, both of you, croaked Uncle Vernon, stuffing the letter back inside his envelope. Harry didn't move. I want my letter, he shouted. Let me see it, demanded Dudley. Out, roared Uncle Vernon. And he took both Harry and Dudley by the scruffs of their necks and threw them into the hall, slamming the kitchen door behind them. Harry and Dudley promptly held, had a furious but silent fight over who would listen at the keyhole. Dudley won. So Harry, his glasses dangling from one ear, lay flat on his stomach to listen at the crack between door and floor. Vernon, Amphitrius was saying in a quivering voice, look at the address. How could they possibly know where he sleeps? You don't think they're watching the house? Watching, spying, maybe following us, muttered Uncle Vernon wildly. But what should we do, Vernon? Should we write back? Tell them we don't want... Harry could see Uncle Vernon's shiny black shoes pacing up and down the kitchen. No, he said finally, no, we'll ignore it. If they don't get an answer, Yes, that's best. We won't do anything. But I'm not having one in the house, Petunia. Didn't we swear when we took him in we'd stamp out that dangerous nonsense? That evening when he got back from work, Uncle Vernon did something he'd never done before. He visited Harry in his cupboard. Where's my letter, said Harry, the moment Uncle Vernon had squeezed the door. Who's writing to me? No one. 
It was addressed to you by mistake, said Uncle Vernon shortly. I have burned it. It was not a mistake, said Harry angrily. It had my cupboard on it. Silence, yelled Uncle Vernon, and a couple of spiders fell from the ceiling. He took a few deep breaths and then forced his face into a smile, which looked quite painful. Uh, yes, Harry, about this cupboard. Your aunt and I have been thinking. You're really getting a bit big for it. We think it might be nice if you moved into Dudley's second bedroom. Why, said Harry. Don't ask questions, snapped his uncle. Take this stuff upstairs, now. The Dursley's house had four bedrooms. One for Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia, one for visitors, usually where Uncle Vernon's sister, Marge, um, one where Dudley slept, and one where Dudley kept all the toys and things that wouldn't fit into his first bedroom. It only took Harry one trip upstairs to move everything he owned from the cupboard to this room. He sat down on the bed and stared around him. Nearly everything in here was broken. The month-old video camera was lying on top of a small working tank Dudley had once driven over the next-door neighbor's dog. In the corner was Dudley's first ever television set, which he'd put his foot through when his, for, when his favorite program had been canceled. There was a large bird cage, which had once held a parrot that Dudley had swapped at school for a real air rifle, which was on top of a shelf with the end all bent because Dudley had sat on it. Other shelves were full of books. They were the only things in the room that looked as though they'd never been touched. From downstairs came the sound of Dudley bawling at his mother. I don't want him in there. I need that room. Make him get out. Harry sighed and stretched out on the bed. Yesterday, he'd have given anything to be up here. Today, he'd rather be back in his cupboard with that letter up here than without, with that letter than up here without it. Next morning at breakfast, everyone was rather quiet. Dudley was in shock. He'd screamed, whacked his father with his smelting stick, been sick on purpose, kicked his mother, and thrown his tortoise through the greenhouse roof, and he still didn't have his room back. Harry was thinking about this time yesterday and bitterly wishing he'd opened the letter in the hall. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia kept looking at each other darkly. When the mail arrived, Uncle Vernon, who seemed to be trying to be nice to Harry, made Dudley go and get it. They heard him banging things with his smelting stick all the way down the hall. Then he shouted, there's another one, Mr. H. Potter, the smallest bedroom for Privet Drive. With a strangled cry, Uncle Vernon leapt from his seat and ran down the hall, Harry right behind him. Uncle Vernon had to wrestle Dudley to the ground to get the letter from him, which was made difficult by the fact that Harry had grabbed Uncle Vernon around the neck from behind. After a minute of confused fighting, in which everyone got hit a lot by the smelting stick, Uncle Vernon straightened up, gasping for breath, with Harry's letter clutched in his hand. Go to your cupboard, I, I mean your bedroom, he wheezed at Harry. Dudley, go, just go. Harry walked round and round his new room. Someone knew he had moved out of his cupboard, and they, someone knew he had moved out of his cupboard, and they seemed to know that he hadn't received his first letter. Surely that meant they'd try again, and this time he'd make sure they didn't fail. He had a plan. The repaired alarm clock rang at six o'clock the next morning. Harry turned it off quickly and dressed silently. He mustn't wake the Dursleys. He stole downstairs without turning on any of the lights. He was going to wait for the postman on the corner of Privet Drive and get the letters from number four first. His heart hammered as he crept across the dark hall towards the front door. Rawr! Harry leapt into the air. He trod on something big and squashy on the doormat, something alive. Lights clicked on upstairs, and to his horror, Harry realized that the big, squashy something had been his uncle's face. Uncle Vernon had been lying at the foot of the front door in a sleeping bag, clearly making sure that Harry didn't do exactly what he'd been trying to do. He shouted at Harry for about half an hour, and then told him to go and make a cup of tea. Harry shuffled miserably off into the kitchen, and by the time he got back, the mail had arrived, right into Uncle Vernon's lap. Harry could see three letters addressed in green ink. I want, he began, but Uncle Vernon was tearing the letters into pieces before his eyes. Uncle Vernon didn't go to work that day. He stayed at home and nailed up the mail slot. See, he explained to Aunt Petunia through a mouthful of nails. If they can't deliver them, they'll just give up. I'm not sure that'll work, Vernon. Oh, these people's minds work in strange ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me, said Uncle Vernon, trying to knock in a nail with a piece of fruit cake Aunt Petunia had just brought him. On Friday, no less than 12 letters arrived for Harry. 
As they couldn't go through the mail slot, they had been pushed under the door, slotted through the sides, and a few even forced through the small window in the downstairs bathroom. Uncle Vernon stayed home again. After burning all the letters, he got out a hammer and nails and boarded up the cracks around the front and back doors so no one could go out. He hummed tiptoe through the tulips as he worked and jumped at small noises. On Saturday, things began to get out of hand. 24 letters to Harry found their way into the house, rolled up and hidden inside each of the two dozen eggs their very confused milkman had handed Aunt Petunia through the living room window. While Uncle, Uncle Vernon made furious telephone calls to the post office and the dairy trying to find someone to complain to, Aunt Petunia shredded the letters in her food processor. Who on earth wants to talk to you this badly? Dudley asked Harry in amazement. On Sunday morning, Uncle Vernon sat down at the breakfast table looking tired and rather ill, but happy. No post on Sundays, he reminded them cheerfully as he spread marmalade on his newspapers. No damn letters today. Something came whizzing down the, chim down the kitchen chimney as he spoke and caught him sharply on the back of the head. Next moment, 30 or 40 letters came pelting out of the fireplace like bullets. The Dursleys ducked, but Harry leapt into the air trying to catch one. Out! Out! Uncle Vernon seized Harry around the waist and threw him into the hall. When Aunt Petunia and Dudley had run out with their arms over their faces, Uncle Vernon slammed the door shut. They could hear the letters still streaming into the room, bouncing off the walls and floor. That does it, says Uncle Vernon, trying to speak calmly but pulling great tufts of his, out of his mustache at the same time. I want you all back here in five minutes, ready to leave. We're going away. Just pack some clothes, no arguments. He looked so dangerous with half his mustache missing that no one dared argue. Ten minutes later, they had wrenched their way through the boarded up doors and were in the car, speeding toward the highway. Dudley was sniffling in the back seat. He was hungry, he'd missed five television programs he wanted to see, and he'd never gone so long without blowing up an alien on his computer. Uncle Vernon stopped at last outside a gloomy looking hotel on the outskirts of a big city. Dudley and Harry shared a room with twin beds and damp, musty sheets. Dudley snored, but Harry stayed awake, sitting on the windowsill, staring down at the lights of passing cars and wondering. They ate stale cornflakes and cold tin tomatoes on toast for breakfast the next day. They had just finished when the owner of the hotel came over to their table. Excuse me, but is one of you Mr. H. Potter? Only I got about a hundred of these at the front desk. She held up a letter so they could read the green ink address. Mr. H. Potter, room 17, Railview Hotel, Cokeworth. Harry made a grab for the letter, but Uncle Vernon knocked his hand out of the way. The woman stared. I'll take them, said Uncle Vernon, standing up quickly and following her from the dining room. Wouldn't it be better just to go home, dear? Aunt Petunia suggested timidly hours later, but Uncle Vernon didn't seem to hear her. Exactly what he was looking for, none of them knew. He drove them into the middle of the forest, got out, looked around, shook his head, got back into the car, and off they went again. The same thing happened in the middle of a plowed field, halfway across a suspension bridge, and at the top of a multi-level parking garage. Daddy's gone mad, hasn't he? Dudley asked Aunt Petunia dully late that afternoon. Uncle Vernon had parked at the coast, locked them all inside the car, and disappeared. It started to rain. Great drops beat on the roof of the car. Dudley sniveled. It's Monday, he told his mother. The gray Umberto's on tonight. I want to stay somewhere with a television. Monday. This reminded some Harry of something. If it was Monday, and you could usually count on Dudley to know the days of the week because of television, then tomorrow, Tuesday, was Harry's 11th birthday. Of course, his birthdays were never exactly fun. Last year, the Dursons had given him a coat hanger and a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Still, you weren't 11 every day. Uncle Vernon was back and he was smiling. He was also carrying a long, thin, thin package and didn't answer Aunt Petunia when she asked what he'd bought. Found the perfect place, he said. Come on, everyone out. It was very cold outside the car. Uncle Vernon was pointing at what looked like a large rock way out at sea. Perched on top of the rock was the most miserable little shack you could imagine. One thing was certain, there was no television in there. Storm forecast for tonight, said Uncle Vernon gleefully, clapping his hands together. And this gentleman kindly agreed to lend us his boat. A toothless old man came ambling up to them, pointing, 
with a rather wicked grin at an old rowboat bobbing in the iron gray water below them. I've already got us some rations, said Uncle Vernon, so all aboard. It was freezing in the boat. Icy sea spray and rain crept down their necks and a chilly wind whipped their faces. After what seemed like hours, they reached the rock where Uncle Vernon, slipping and sliding, led the way to the broken down house. The inside was horrible. It smelled strongly of seaweed, the wind whistled through the gaps in the wooden walls, and the fireplace was damp and empty. There were only two rooms. Uncle Vernon's rations turned out to be a bag of chips each and four bananas. He tried to start a fire, but the empty chip bags just smoked and shriveled up. Could do with some of those letters now, eh? He said cheerfully. He was in a very good mood. Obviously, he thought nobody had a chance of reaching them here in a storm to deliver mail. Harry privately agreed, though the thought didn't cheer him up at all. As night fell, the promised storm blew up around them. Spray from the high waves splattered the walls of the hut, and a fierce wind rattled the filthy windows. Aunt Petunia found a few moldy blankets in the second room and made up a bed for Dudley on the moth-eaten sofa. She and Uncle Vernon went off to the lumpy bed next door, and Harry was left to find the softest bit of floor he could and to curl up under the thinnest, most ragged blanket. The storm raged more and more ferociously as the night went on. Harry couldn't sleep. He shivered and turned over, trying to get comfortable, his stomach rumbling with hunger. Dudley's snores were, drown were drowned by the, light by the low rolls of thunder that started near midnight. The lighted dial of Dudley's watch, which was dangling over the edge of the sofa on his fat wrist, told Harry he'd be 11 in 10 minutes' time. He lay and watched his birthday tick nearer, wondering if the Dursleys would remember at all, wondering where the letter writer was now. Five minutes to go. Harry heard something creak outside. He hoped the roof wasn't going to fall in, although he might be warmer if it did. Four minutes to go. Maybe the house in Privet Drive would be so full of letters when they got back that he'd be able to steal one somehow. Three minutes to go. Was that the sea, slapping hard on the rock like that? And two minutes ago, what was that funny crunching noise? Was the rock crumbling into the sea? One minute to go, and he'd be 11. 30 seconds. 20. 10. 9. Maybe he'd wake Dudley up just to annoy him. 3, 2, 1. Boom. The whole shack shivered, and Harry sat bolt upright, staring at the door. Someone was outside, knocking to come in. 